Okay, guys, is the market primed for a crash or is this just a healthy pullback? Today, we're looking at a lot of macro data. We're going to pull up the charts here in a second and also just look at a lot of the different variables and strings that can be pulled and why so many people are freaking out today. I mean, we've got you know coins from the Silk Road getting dumped on the markets. We've got huge pullbacks in crypto. We've got Tesla and other stocks that are really taking a dive, and we've got a potentially changing macro picture. What do you guys see as kind of the major things and risks that people should be looking out for right now? Yeah, pretty interesting market out there today and to start the week. We'll see if this correction is just a dip for ants or a real viable dip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so looking through some of the macro stuff over the past couple of days, you know, we've got rates up on the US government bond side. So yields are up quite a bit, particularly uh, in the longer end of the curve. So the 10 year, the 30 year are up. And we've also had things like gold and energy prices, gold, crude oil, those assets have been up and now we're getting a pullback in stocks. So it's an interesting shift here in the market where we see, you know, the stocks that have done very well this year, like the S&P and the NASDAQ pulling back while some of these other asset classes rip higher. And the concern now for a lot of investors is, uh-oh, are we in a reinflation re scenario or a reflation scenario? Is this like the 1970s where, you know, gold and crude oil are going to be ripping higher while stocks and other risk assets pull back? So that's the big question. You know, I have my opinions, but it's a, it's a very interesting and changing market environment for sure. So and what are your opinions? Is this the beginning <laughs> of the end? Is the bull market over? Or like you said, is this a pullback for ants? <laughs> I think right now, from what I can tell, that this will be a potential viable dip. I'd like to see it dip a lot harder, uh, particularly on the stock side. I'd like to see a good 5 to 10% pullback in the overall indices. But yeah, when you look at the reason for the higher yields, a big part of it is the economic strength that we're seeing in the U.S. and also outside the U.S., we had manufacturing numbers, ISM manufacturing numbers in the US that came in higher than last the last couple of months at the beginning of the week. We also saw the Chinese manufacturing data come in higher for I think the fourth or fifth month in a row. So it looks like maybe the Chinese economy is finally waking up potentially as well. So that would be a big part of the overall global economic growth story. And we've also seen improvements in some of the other places as well in Europe, UK, showing some green shoots of improvement as well. So, yeah, it's kind of a story right now of a pretty strong looking economy. Other data points that we could point to include things like subdued weekly unemployment claims. Those remain very low. We had the JOLTS job openings numbers. Those remain steady. We had retail sales numbers and weekly retail sales numbers from Redbook that look quite strong over the past few weeks. And so all those point to a relatively strong economy. We know higher stock prices over the last year have helped you know, with wealth effects for the consumer. So the, the economy looks pretty solid. But that's also starting to flow through to things like energy prices, where you know crude is is indicating that demand from China and other places may be picking up, and and that could actually put a cap on where the economy goes in the short run, because as we know, higher yields will translate into higher borrowing costs for things like mortgages for consumers, or even corporate bond yields or corporate bond rates for companies, and so that will have an effect that will counteract some of that economic strength, and so. It's like we want to remain in this Goldilocks environment. We want there to be economic growth, but not too strong of growth such that it stokes high inflation. So it's it's challenging the upper end right now for the Fed and the, the Fed rate cuts. The narrative is now that rate cuts may be off the table until much later in the year. So that could be something that gives us that viable dip in the market here. Interesting. Yeah, even though you know today uh, we're actually recording this on Tuesday, April 2nd, um, all markets have been pulling back pretty strong. You can see across the indices, you know, they're down over a percent. Bitcoin, as of right now, down about five or six percent on the day. Um, and when you zoom out, though, and you look at specifically, you know, the crypto markets like Bitcoin and then the stock indices like the ES and the NQ, um, we're coming off of basically massive bull runs, right? We had an unprecedented seven month green streak in Bitcoin, which is as far as I know, never happened before. Um, usually five or six months is kind of where you start to get a pullback. And so, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see April being a red month, you know, statistically saying, I mean, that is 
highly likely. And what I think will be interesting though, is if you look at, for you guys watching the video, where this seven month streak started down here in September, down around, you know, 25,000 sitting up above, you know, 65 or 70 K that is an extremely fast and large move. And so if we look at that as kind of the a start and a pivot top in the market for a Fibonacci retracement. I mean, we could come all the way back down into the 40s, the $40,000 range, and technically still be in a bull market. I mean, the moving averages are still very far away, both on the, the daily and the weekly chart. And so right now the market is testing kind of the 60K zone, which was the prior all-time high range, right? There, there's a lot of trading activity that happened in between like 60 and 65K. And so the market now is really testing to see if it can stay above that zone, which happens to be the 23% Feb retracement. So um, that's what I think all eyes are going to be on. If we snap 60 K, I think we're going to get a pretty fast pullback down closer to actually 50 K. So there's a lot of downside potential, but I'm going to be keeping a close eye on that. And also the NQ. So if you look at the NASDAQ, it's basically been in this upward trending channel also since last fall. And we're kind of challenging the support range of that today. Um, and so if stocks and Bitcoin continue to kind of track each other, as we've seen over the past month or so, you know, you can just see when you look at the daily chart of Bitcoin and the daily chart of the, the NASDAQ, I mean, there's a lot of like similarity there as they've been kind of consolidating together. So that's what I'm keeping my eye on. Um, Nikki, what about you? What do you see out there? Or what are you watching? Well, I wanted to just kind of share my thoughts on what I think is going to happen if we do see this dip is it viable or is it you know the end of the bull market and i was talking to a friend of mine this weekend who actually pulled all of their money out of the market um you know it was back in 2022 when things were looking pretty rough uh because they thought things were going to get worse and they pulled cash out completely flat in, in stocks and they asked me hey nikki you know what do you think is going to happen are we going to see are we finally going to see a correction in in this in stocks and uh what kind of correction is it going to be and i was like well you know um uh, my opinion personally is that i think that it's we could see you know five to ten percent and i think max ten percent in my opinion um unless something really kind of ch changes in the economy and inflation um becomes a big issue but I think this is going to be a viable dip in both Bitcoin and stocks. I think that there's still a lot of people that want to get in. There's a lot of people looking for value um, and they're not finding it right now. So it's kind of leading to kind of a stagnant um, stagnant, stagnant market in a way. Uh, price action has kind of chugged along nicely, but it does look like it's trying to slow down. So um, I think that a correction will have people see value again in, in U.S. stocks, at least. And a lot of people that have been in cash waiting, they're probably going to buy it up if it comes. So I think that the dip, you know, is going to be a nice, healthy correction in the overall bull trend. It's not going to change the bull structure, in my opinion, on Bitcoin or uh, in stocks. And I think a lot of people are probably going to there's going to be money in demand to buy it. That's kind of my opinion. Yeah. I mean, if, if we just look at the, um, the prior all time high from back in 2021, um, a 10% dip from this current bull market would actually be a retest of that prior all time high. And it would get us closer to the hundred and 200 period moving averages. So yeah, I think I agree with you there. Like a 10% pullback, get down into some Fibonacci retracement zones and moving averages and prior resistance turn support areas. I, I, I also tend to agree. I mean, unless the, the macro picture really changes or there's any major black swans that, that start to pop up. Um, tribe, do you see anything like that? Any other major risks that could kind of change the, the long-term bull thesis here? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the two things mentioned that I mentioned earlier, which are rates and energy prices, you know, crude always has the potential to have some super spike on a geopolitical event that could really, you know, start to cool the overall market because, 
you know, that's going to feed in potentially to more inflation in certain areas like goods, et cetera. So that would be a concern is if you get like some big spike up in crude. And right now it's just kind of quietly chugging higher on what I think is due to global economic strength. But if we got a geopolitical event on top of that, you know, something with Russia or God forbid el elsewhere again, then that could become, you know, a, a black swan type scenario that could really uh, put some pressure on the market. The other one is rates and rates really, I think, is where we could get the narrative for a big, bigger dip like you're talking about, like a five to 10 percent correction in the overall market. Because if you start to price out Fed cuts from where they're where they're being priced at around June, July time frame, if those start to get pushed and you start to have people believe that there may be no rate cuts this year or even no rate cuts until, say, fall or winter time frame, then that could change the dynamic of the the risk that people are willing to take in stocks, especially if you have, you know, say that the 10 year or the 30 year pushing up into the 5% or higher level on yields. And so that is an area that I'd be watching very closely as a stock investor, as a signal for risk on or risk off. And of course, there's a, another event happening in crypto this month that you could probably talk to that has the potential to change all of the dynamics, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the having is still scheduled, I believe, for 420. So, I mean, <laughs> hopefully price gets back up to 69K. I mean, for no other reason other than we're immature children, and that would just be really fun. Um, <laughs> Was that so, date strategically, like, coded in or something? No. Like 420? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, if you, you know, if we take a look at uh, Bitcoin block app, you can see, you know, the ETA is still around 420 in the afternoon. So that, that would be a fun day. We're going to definitely do some kind of live stream oh, or have some kind of party. Uh, yeah. But yeah, we, we've got, you know, just over a couple of weeks left. And one thing to keep in mind, though, is like, prior halvings have not been immediate catalysts for for price to just rocket like you can see back here in 2020 it was flat for you know several months after the halving and then even in 2016 even though we were in the middle of a uh, a bull market it was you know it still took a month or two for it to to break to new all-time highs so I always said like, look, I, I don't think like a having event is like a buy on the actual day type of thing. In fact, we've gone up so strong so fast um, in such a short period of time that I think it would actually be kind of healthy for price to consolidate through the having maybe even a month or two after the having and then give us that breakout above that like 75k resistance area. Um, or, you know, if we get a, a gnarly dip and a washout maybe on some FUD like we're seeing today, you know, as of uh, today, people are all, you know, like basically FUDing crypto Twitter talking about the Silk Road uh, Bitcoins that have basically moved to what people think is Coinbase. And so maybe they've already dumped them today. Maybe they're getting ready to, I don't know. But, you know, it's only, and I, it's funny because I say only 2 billion worth, but when you look at the, asset class now that is you know well over 1.2 or 1.3 trillion two billion really is a drop in the bucket especially when you look at the uh the inflows that have been coming just from the the etfs so uh would i panic sell my bitcoin just because the u.s government sold a couple billion nope <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm sure they're terrible at market timing <laughs> they they really are they sold some um the last confirmed sale in late 22 basically near the bottom was 50,000 bitcoins which it uh or sorry uh in March 2023 they unloaded just shy of 10,000 coins for like uh 200 million so yeah they're not market timing they're not traders but hey if anybody from the government's listening and you want to learn how to better trade uh hit us up and we'll we'll give you a little tutorial <laughs> <laughs> i think one interesting dynamic from the having that will be fun to watch is what happens with the publicly traded crypto miner stocks you know that's been a very hot area within a, a, a nice category of, of stocks that have really run, um, particularly for certain periods throughout the last like six months or so. They've There's been some periods where they've ripped higher. There's been some pullbacks, but overall just very high volatility. And the miners are going to have a tough time, I think, with this halving just because, you know, obviously they're going to have their revenue halved overnight from the halving of the block rewards. 
but you know, the a lot of people have been anticipating that the halving would actually lead to a rapid rise in the price of Bitcoin. And if that doesn't happen and you have their block rewards getting halved at the same time, you could have a pretty big pullback in the crypto miner stocks. And so that could be an area where we see quite a bit of volatility. Now, will those be a buy at that point? You could probably make the case for some of them that that might be an interesting buy the dip opportunity. But yeah, that that will be an interesting area of the market to watch on the stock side that that will have ramifications directly from that having. So it's it, they really need they they need price to respond in a positive way in the months after the having. If that doesn't happen, a lot of these miners are going to find themselves very quickly moving from a, a bull market and a, a great happy moment in time to a very tough market for them again, like maybe even like 2022. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I actually saw a tweet the other day that was kind of interesting. It was like, name one part of the market that's actually gone down in price over the past couple mm -hmm. of years. And I was having a hard time thinking about it. I mean, yeah, even Bitcoin miners through the, the bear market, they obviously got hit, but specifically through this bull market over the last year. Um, the only thing I can really think of that's gone down is bitcoin clones like bsv and um i mean bitcoin cash people are still buying for some reason but um <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know altcoins on average have risen quite a bit we've been in altcoin season since last fall um so yeah it's been interesting i saw that tweet too and i thought to myself austin real estate maybe <laughs> oh, yeah that's a good one yeah although it's, it's still up quite a bit it's that's still right. up quite a bit but it is down compared to other markets i think but let me give yeah. you let me give you an asset that's down a lot that maybe surprises people it's the worst performing stock in the s p 500 year to date it's down over 30 percent year to date and down today oh. <laughs> nope tesla <laughs> tesla, tesla baby <laughs> yeah. yep You're right. very... look at this if we if we look at the year to date charts so I've got the the magnificent seven plus Berkshire's class B shares. You know, Apple's down like 10%, Tesla's down 33%, and then um NVIDIA up over 80, Meta up over 40, Microsoft up over 12, Amazon up 19, Google up 10. So yeah, man, it's it's a little painful to be a Tesla bull this year, huh? Yeah, it has been quite painful. Uh, I'm not a Tesla investor myself. I definitely see some longer term opportunity in some of their large addressable markets like, you know, autonomous cars and humanoid robots. That has potential to to make Tesla a much more interesting business over time. But the current issue for Tesla is demand for EV seems to be falling off a cliff. Um at least for Tesla, you know, prices have been slashed and volumes they just reported their their Q1 delivery number, which came in at 387,000. That's 9% lower than the first quarter of last year. So you actually had Tesla delivery numbers shrink year over year. So this whole narrative of Tesla being a secular growth company is now being called into question. And that's that's a big deal. You know, Tesla seeing intense competition in the Chinese market, but also in the US market where they've cut prices, demand hasn't really responded. So that's that's a big deal. Now some people believe this is just a short-term blip and that Tesla will be okay and that eventually they'll grow later in the year, they'll grow in the years ahead, but it's it's not looking great in the short term and we'll get Tesla's full financial report in a couple of weeks, but it's probably going to look pretty ugly for Q1. Is this just competition heating up? Is it maybe people losing interest in EVs because of charging issues? Is like what what are you thinking people want hybrids instead? Like maybe yeah. let's causing this it's a great question i you know i think it's a combination of factors and it's probably a number of the things you mentioned it's certainly competition although in the us i still don't think tesla really has seen the full brunt of competition i mean we have you know a lot of companies that are producing very high priced models or you know models that uh, really aren't selling super well uh, tesla still dominates the top of the charts in terms of vehicles sold in the us um, but it could be an issue, a little bit of saturation of, of demand for Teslas in the short run, for sure. They haven't, you know, come out with any new models other than the Cybertruck, which is only in, in relatively small production still. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's some saturation. There's also the effect of higher interest rates. You know, these are higher priced cars. EVs in general are higher priced. And so that's definitely affected demand on the margin. 
And then certainly in other markets outside the US, like China, there has been intense competition from these Chinese makers like BYD and others who you know, have actually started to create some pretty nice looking vehicles with some pretty good tech inside and they're pricing them below 30K and in some cases below 20K in some markets, which is wild to see. Dude, so we were just in Mexico City for a month and we air, not Airbnb, we Ubered everywhere. And I would say the majority of the Ubers that we took were those BYD Chinese brand. Um, I, I guess they're fully electric, yep. but they were nice, man. And they look like they were actually built to be kind of taxis where the back seat was like extra long. Mm. Um, and yeah, they were, they were pretty sweet and they didn't look super luxurious, but they looked very economical. And yeah, like most Uber drivers actually had those. And then another anecdotal story for you. This morning, I drove just hap I haven't driven over there in forever, but I happened to drive by the Gigafactory here in Austin, where the, I believe is where they're primarily making the cyber trucks, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And outside, they what looked like at least several hundred trucks. I couldn't quite see everything, but they had a ton of trucks just kind of sitting out there. I don't know if they're just waiting to be delivered or whatever, but here in Austin, I've seen several of them driving away and my God, are they hideous? You know, <laughs> I, I, I know some people love Told them. And, you know, even, even during the, the first announcement, I was like, hell yeah, that looks cool. But whenever I see them in person, I'm like, man, these things look junky. And you know, look at this, even like, you know, people are, are basically making fun of like, you know, what they advertised as far as the, the tent situation, how it looks so badass and futuristic and so cool. And then like what the reality is, it just looks like so cheap and ridiculous. So I don't know, man, in Tesla fashion, maybe a little overhyped and all the like serious truck guys I know just point out in problems with the design of the cyber truck from, you know, dangerous you know, finger popping angles to how impractical the truck bed really is. So I canceled my reservation a long time ago for Bitcoin related reasons, but um, did you guys yeah, see the, know. did you see the video of the guy who had a cucumber and a carrot and he put it at, on the um, trunk and you know how it's the automatic yeah. automatic trunk and he did it for like all these different cars and the cyber truck like destroyed the carrot and the, and the, uh, yeah, chopped Cucumber, it right off, right? Chopped it right off. And like the yeah. other cars, like the Toyota and, you know, whatever other ones that they did were very gentle and like learned that it was a finger, you know, imitating a finger and it opened it right back up. So, I mean, I don't know if that's true with all of them or if that was just a singled out case with that Cybertruck, but that is like kind of scary. <laughs> I think, you know, Cybertruck may turn out to be a bit of a flop. Like, I think, you know, they're going to have higher production this year. They're going to sell out the, the early demand. Uh, the real question for me on Cybertruck is what is longer term sustainable demand look like? And it's really not clear yet if that's going to be a successful product, but I do think the success of Tesla may not really come down to Cybertruck at all. I think, you know, one bullish thing that should get some credit here as we talk about Tesla is that they they have had pretty raving reviews for the newest version of the autopilot software or the full self-driving, as they call it, the version 12 or 12.3, whatever their newest version is, that's slowly rolling out to the fleet. Uh, is reportedly much, much better than the previous version. So, you know, maybe Tesla's Good. claim that full self-driving is right around the corner may actually be closer to being true. And if so, then you could start to really build that case for autonomous Tesla taxis and things like that. And so that would open up, you know, a bigger, broader market potentially. And Tesla probably needs to come out with some newer models. We know they're working on, you know, new Roadster. We know that they're working on a potentially lower cost EV model which I think will be really important. A lot of people in the US have been just clamoring for lower price vehicles in general, EV or not. You know, the the amount of vehicles available for under a 30K MSRP is, has been shrinking. So I do think whether it's Tesla or if the Chinese manufacturers ever come in or are allowed to come into the US market, someone is going to dominate at those lower price points at some point. And, you know, again, that could be Tesla or potentially it could be the competition. But there's yeah, I, I've I've heard a lot of people clamoring yeah. for these uh this like 10k pickup truck that mm -hmm. I think is being sold mostly in Thailand. It's just a super basic but very reliable, you know, Toyota pickup. 
And um, I know in the U.S., man, most people just can't afford a eighty or ninety thousand dollar truck, or and then have 30. a fifteen hundred dollar car payment. Yeah, even a thirty thousand dollar car is hard for most Americans. Like, yeah, so yeah. it's a challenge. All right, let, let let's do this. Let's jump into some questions. We got a bunch of them. Um, so we've got a few questions from our wealth building community members. We'll hit some of those first. Um, the first question is like, how do you guys usually play what you call a graceful exit on an open position that didn't turn out as expected? And so in the community, I talk about this a lot. Like if I have a trade open and I close it and I call it a graceful exit, that just basically means I don't care if I'm a little bit profitable or a little bit underwater. What I'm looking to do is just cut the trade because it's not doing what I want it to. So I'm not worried about profit targets or even necessarily like hitting a specific stop zone. It's like, okay, this isn't following what I expected and I want to free up the capital and mental space. And I can always re-enter later, but I, I think something that a lot of people kind of underappreciate is how much open trades actually take of your mental bandwidth. And for me, I like to have as few trades on as possible. And if something's not performing or it just isn't doing what I want, I'll, I'll cut it off no matter if I'm, a, again, a little profitable or a little underwater, knowing that I can always get back in. So I, I think that's something that might be able to help people if you're looking for a better way to, to kind of manage trades. Well said. Um, yeah, you're you're really good at that. I, I think it's something that I, you know, still am trying to get better at because I I have this draw towards like a low cost basis, and you know I love like averaging down on stuff that I still like for the long term. But there are definitely cases where you know something I'm not I'm not paying close enough attention to a fundamental shift that I need to be. And we always say if the fundamentals or the thesis have truly changed, then you need to get out. Like even if you're down 20, 30 percent, it's not worth. You know, trying to hodl to get back to break even so you can sell it at break even. Chances are, if the fundamentals or thesis are broken, you're not getting back to break even. So exit yep. that and use the capital elsewhere. So I definitely think uh, you've mastered the art of of getting out of trades that you shouldn't be in. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, it's something I've had a lot of practice with. Um, all right, next question uh, from Crypto Anon. Uh, he was saying there's a narrative of aging populations. Um, I want to top into this as part of my long-term portfolio. What's a good way to play this besides pharma stocks? I, I think this is a smart thing, but I also think like trading or investing based on like multi-decade demographic shifts. I don't know. To me, it seems hard. Do you guys have an opinion on that? I know there's guys like Harry Dent that, you know, make that their core thesis based on like, you know, population shifts, but um, do you guys use it at all? If so, what opportunities might there be for somebody to invest or trade off of demographics? I've actually thought of this specific one myself, like the aging population. When you become a financial planner, you learn a lot about how expensive it is to get old. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, I haven't looked deeply into nursing home financials, but I bet that would be fascinating to do. Um, but you could, you know, outside of pharma stocks, you could also play, uh, there are REITs, um, real estate investment trusts. They trade just like stocks. And there are some REITs that basically invest in nursing homes or, you know, um, assisted living uh, apartments, things like that, like the real estate side of it. So, mm -hmm. um, that could be an angle that you could, uh, try. I haven't done a lot of research on those REITs specifically, but I know that they do ex exist. I, I know some guys in Florida that have um, invested or developed like assisted living places and they are just cash cows, man. Like I, I don't know Crazy. recently with like the cost of land and just property in general, what the cap rates would be. But I know, you know, five or 10 years ago when these guys were building some of these things and raising money in Florida, like the, they've been performing really well. So I don't know how they do on like the REIT level, on the publicly traded level, but I know as a general business idea, they can be really, really profitable. 
Well, the boomers are, I believe, are they? The, they're the biggest population right now, I think. Um, I'd have to double check that. But I think millennials you know, might out, is it millennials? outpace them a little bit. Yeah, I want to say. There's a the lot of boomers, generation. though, right? If I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. And that's going to be, you know, a big, you know, aging population. That's going to probably create a bit of a boom in healthcare. care. Yeah. And, and maybe on that question too, we can talk, maybe introduce like some more real estate ideas. We had a few questions from the community, you know, asking us to share insights on the real estate market overall, you know, commercial versus residential, um, or any good real estate ETFs or, you know, leading indicators for the real estate market. So do you guys have any thoughts in general on that? Yeah, I think you said something earlier, which is interesting. And I've experienced in my career that it's very difficult to make money on a pure long-term demographic or secular thesis. So with things like slow demographic changes, you know, they're inevitable snowballs that are rolling down the hill, but actually picking stocks based on that and having like an annual performance that reflects that is very difficult. Now, where it can become interesting is those secular shifts become part of a group of stocks or just a theme that really changes the sentiment or the valuation multiples of those group of stocks over, over say, a five or 10 year time frame. An example would be like cloud software. It had a nice tailwind from 2005 to 2020. Uh, it didn't mean that every cloud software stock won, and there were certain ones that did much, much better than others. So you still have to, I think, pay attention to the fundamentals of the individual companies and a lot of the things that happen on a monthly basis or even annual basis are going to be totally unrelated to the demographic or secular trends. So I think if you're going to use that as the basis for your investment thesis, you also need to have a reason to own the individual stocks themselves outside of the, the basic secular or demographic trends. So that's something that I'd point out there. As far as real estate is concerned, there are many different ways to play that asset class. And the hard part is trying to figure out where within that, that you want to have exposure. For instance, everyone's worried about commercial real estate right now. So CRE has been a tough place to be. And a lot of the CRE REITs, even some of the apartment REITs like Camden, things like that have been underperforming over the past two or three years. And the obvious reason has been interest rates. If you look at, you know, things like the 10 year yield or the 30 year yield, Typically, they're going to be negatively correlated to a lot of those real estate stocks, particularly in areas of real estate that are more economically sensitive. So that's a leading indicator you could look at if you're trying to put on real estate exposure. Uh, certainly, yields would be, you know, again, pretty negatively correlated to real estate overall. Um, CRE, you know, there's been questions about whether or not that's going to bring down the economy. If you actually look at the data, the percentage of CRE assets on all the banks' balance sheets is pretty low. But there are individual banks and regional banks where the exposure is actually much higher in YCB, for instance, and some of the other regional banks. So that becomes a problem for those individual institutions. But I don't see it as a, a major black swan that's going to tank the market on an overnight basis the way that you know MBS did with Lehman in 2008. It's not really the same structure. It's not really the same exposure. Um, so there might be opportunities in CRE when you reach a point at which they're oversold and maybe rates are high, but they're slated to come down. Um, I personally like other parts of the real estate market a little bit more. I think personally, like I think things like, you know, grocery store anchored, anchored properties, or even things like, um, you know, multifamily in certain areas that are growing fast, maybe the nursing stocks or the nursing REITs could be interesting. Although some of those have very, very high leverage, like BKD, for instance, just has a very levered balance sheet. So I'd want to own it. It's just too levered for me right now. So yeah, it's such a large the asset builders class. Has just, the builders have yeah. just been kicking ass. I mean, a lot of them are at all-time highs or still hovering up around that area. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Builders have been very surprising in, in how strong they've performed. And I think similar to what we were talking about with the EVs, I think the the difference there is that you know they're actually building lower price homes and new homes that can be, you know, that there's a lot of demands for still. So existing mm -hmm. homes have fallen off a cliff. But new home sales have held up a little bit better and the home builders are reflecting that. So, uh, again, it's kind of like if you look at an asset class as a whole, something as large as real estate, it's really hard to generalize. But within that, if you start to go into the subsectors and figure out what's actually benefiting and where there's actually a trend that looks pretty good, I think that's where, you know, it makes sense to, to focus attention in some of these subsectors to really get deep in the weeds. You could, that's where you find the opportunities within large asset classes like that. Well said. Well said. All right. Um, we've got a few more questions here. Let's take a look. Alex was asking, how do you identify popcorn season 
early enough to make entries. So um, for anybody that doesn't know, popcorn season is where altcoin season starts. It's the early signs of life in the crypto sphere. Um, it's not when you have all tides rising, but let's say out of, you know, a hundred projects, you'll start to see on a, a, on a week or a month, you'll see two, three, five, seven, ten 10 ish coins start to make breakouts of their like low accumulation ranges. And the best barometer or the best chart for that is total three. And so in the community, I was saying, okay, all the way back here from late 2022 to actually like late 2023, um, we were actually in a confirmed bear market. It wasn't until October of 23 that we started to see signs of life, aka popcorn season here through December. And then it was actually in December of last year that we broke out into a confirmed altcoin season. And what we look for there is price on the market cap chart to break the cleanest, closest and lowest um, horizontal line of resistance. That's where, you know, we're kind of confirmed and you can see over the past four months or so um, alts have done really well, but we weren't in here trying to buy this falling knife and this like really nasty grinding um, price action, we waited for first signs of life and popcorn season and then confirmation with altcoin season. So, yeah, I hope that's helpful. Um, Nikki, I got a question for you. Uh, Nathan Young was asking pensions and retirement. I know pensions aren't much of a thing, but how would that be into how could that be incorporated into retirement? Um, and does it relieve pressure from saving intensely in other buckets like an IRA or a brokerage account? And maybe if there's a, another way that you want to rephrase that question. Yeah, basically, how do you consider future pensions that you expect to get in the future when you're saving for retirement? Does that mean if you're getting a pension that you can kind of ease up on investing in your brokerage account or your IRA or any other, you know, accounts um, because you'll have that pension to kind of offset some of your income. So people like to approach this different ways. There are people that are very conservative and don't want to include their pension when they're doing their retirement planning or they're planning for their escape velocity portfolio number, like we talk about in the community. Um, they don't want to include it because it's like a, to them, it's like a, what if something happens? What if the pension goes, you know, belly up and they get barely anything, uh, in the future? Because guess what guys, people don't know this, but all of, uh, you that have pensions, those pensions, uh, those, those people managing those pensions, they're investing in stocks. They're investing in private equity. They're investing in bonds. They're investing in all types of different assets. Um, and there's risk on the table. They invest those assets that um, to be able to fulfill those obligations in the future to you. So a lot of people don't realize that, but there is risk with your pension. Now, with that said, there's also insurance that's carried, you know, to protect you. But uh, that doesn't, if something does happen, then you might not get 100% of what you expect in the future. So there's the conservative side, not including it and it being just a bonus and just an extra great thing that you're going to have later which social security works the same way. We don't, we don't really know what that's going to look like in the future. Um, or you can include it and hopefully your pension um, has a really good history. You know, every, there are different States that have different uh, pension plans and uh, different ways of managing and different success. And so uh, if you feel like you've got a really reliable pension ahead of you, or you're not too far away from retirement, then yeah, that could be something you include and utilize it to help offset some of that needed retirement income. So people like to approach it either conservatively and not include it just to be safe. And then there are people that like to include it um, because they're they're pretty confident that they're going to be getting that guaranteed income. And I, I, I know us as like small business owners and, you know, entrepreneurs, we can set up our own pension, um, which is a way to get like massive tax deductions. So that's also a thing. If you're not working for a large company and you're an entrepreneur, you can still do that in certain cases, right? 
Yeah. Anybody that's a high income earning entrepreneur has the opportunity to set up a pension plan, which is very, very helpful. I yep. think absolutely it too. It, like you said, like you said, Nikki may depend on, you know, who's funding the pension and what was the financial uh, health of that entity that's funding it and managing it. Because, you know, we've seen, for instance, back in the GFC, there were automotive companies or other companies that had large underfunded pensions that went bankrupt. And so there were, you know, pensioners who got, you know, cents on the dollar for what they thought their pensions were going to be. So yeah. if your pension is from something that is either underfunded or not, not managed well, or maybe attached to a state government that has financial troubles, then you may not want to value that at a hundred cents on the dollar. Um, if your you know pension mm -hmm. comes from a very steady fifty billion dollar university endowment that seems like it's pretty conservatively managed, then maybe it's closer to a hundred cents on the dollar that you'd want to value it at. Yeah, yeah, well Good said. Point. Yep. Hey, what what do you guys think is the prettiest chart out there right now? Ooh, the prettiest. Yeah. Abercrombie what, what and Fitch. Duh. <laughs> oh, okay. Let me see. Actually, I haven't looked at up. it in a few days, but. <laughs> yeah, oh, I mean, that is a pretty damn nice chart. Um, a and F has been in a straight bull run for basically, yeah, over a year. I mean, and you were, where were you guys buying this? I was buying on all types of areas, uh, near the lows, basically. But you're, you're up like a 10 X on this, right? Almost. Yeah. Nice. Almost. Okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm holding out to see if it's going to 10 X on me. We'll see. I'm close. Okay. Well, what I was going for was this gold chart. Um, oh. I, you know, I, I've been saying this since last year, but I thought this was technically, as far as like basic TA goes, was the prettiest chart that I've seen across all asset classes. And I know, you know, the crypto folks hate to hear that, but, you know, I, I even wrote about this last week because I said, you know, gold's breaking all time highs, but is it losing its shine? Just because it has an awesome chart doesn't mean it's a great performer. In fact, I ran the numbers, and I think this is correct. You know, the 10-year CAGR or the compound annual growth rate for the past 10 years from last week, it was basically returning about 5.5% a year. So not terrible, you know, maybe keeping up with inflation, but it appears that Bitcoin which has been compounding over a hundred percent over the same 10 year period um, has been a much better asset class. And to me is a much better source uh, or I guess better money type asset. Um, but I do have a couple percent of my portfolio in gold um, that I was building back here from 2014 to 2019. So it's nice to see in, to see it play out. And maybe, you know, if you were going to trade this on leverage through the futures markets, it'd be more profitable, which, by the way, I don't. Gold is super thin and very spiky and loves to run stops. But um, it is nice to see that the the chart is working. It's just not really the, the best performing asset. But what's in interesting is, you know, like today, it's up a little over 2%. It's such a large asset class that a, you know, a 1% or a 2% move is is pretty big. You know, it's now over 15 trillion. And so Bitcoin's currently battling silver for the number eight spot around 1.3 to 1.5 trillion. Um, and so the the bull thesis for Bitcoin obviously is, okay, well, what if it catches up with gold or, you know, flips gold? That'd be at least a 10x from here. Um, so that's one, I guess, mental model you can use. But I don't know. I just wanted to point this out that I think it's interesting and you know, even when you got guys like Peter Schiff that are celebrating this all time high break, it's like, OK, great. But, you know, go back and look at what the the actual returns have been. And it's really not that impressive. Do you agree, Stock Geek? Yeah, I unfortunately have to agree. I'm sorry for the for the gold bugs out there. Although, you know, gold has been picking up steam. So it'll be interesting to see where we are, you know, 6, 12, 18 months from now. And if that's still true, because, 
you know, I do think it's it plays an interesting role as a hedge in the portfolio. And now that it's actually generating some positive and increasing returns, it, it could be getting more interesting here. I definitely think there's some momentum building behind it. There's certainly a lot of demand for gold coming out of Asia and U.S. and European demand has been relatively weak. So if you start to get U.S. and European demand flowing into gold in addition to the Asian bid, you could really have some pretty big price movements here going forward. We'll, we'll just have to see it, how it plays out. Yeah, in the early 2000s, you know, gold was trading actually from like basically the 80s through the early 2000s, it was trading around, you know, 250 to 500. And then when the ETFs came out, that drove it, you know, more than 600% from the, the low 200s to almost 2000. And so could this be like the second leg of that? Um, I, I think so. I mean, that's what the chart is showing. So it'll be interesting to see if the the returns become greater over the the you know next two to five years. Um, but again, my my Bitcoin portfolio currently dwarfs my gold holdings. So we'll see. Um, okay. Hey, I wanted to ask you guys too. Um, did you see the news about California setting the minimum? wage for fast food workers at $20? And if so, what do you think of that? Was it a smart move? Is it a dumb move? What do you guys think? I kind of don't want to comment on this because it's <laughs> such an inflammatory topic. It is. That's why I, I mean, to look, Cali California is expensive as hell to live in. So mm -hmm. I guess if you go state by state and think about, you know, what what the minimum wage gets you from state to state, then, you know, look, it's not great for small business owners. Um, corporations can probably swing it, but small business owners already are having a hard time. So, you know, I don't know. There's, I guess there's puts and takes with that argument. Yeah. Okay. okay. That was a, that was a, that was a very safe answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm a safe uh, now. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't think step functions in wage regulations are ever really a good thing. So when you have a step function up in minimum wage, I don't think it's it's healthy because like Nikki said, it, it really throws small businesses and even medium and large size large size businesses into a pickle. And even though it helps, you know, capital and labor, or I'm sorry, not capital, but it helps the, the labor class, um, just that volatility really can create issues with, you know, with um, profit margins and, and being able to plan and things like that for businesses. And that ultimately is not a good thing. So what would make more sense to me is if, you know, if a state is or a country is going to, you know, have their minimum wage and be resetting it at different points, what they should do is just tie it to an inflation index or tie it to some other measure that changes it slowly or more slowly over time so that it, it isn't as difficult to plan for or it's not a shock on the business side of the economy because that's going to create really weird incentives. It's going to create, you know, potentially some business bankruptcies. And ultimately, that's not going to be good for job growth, which is ultimately right. going to flow back to the consumer itself. So, yeah, I mean, I think I think just the way that we've designed the system in the United States at both the federal and the state level of setting minimum wage at just random various intervals is really stupid. <laughs> so yeah. I don't like how California has done it. I don't like how the U.S. has done it at the federal level. I think actually the U.S. federal level may be on the opposite end where they're too far behind the curve and they haven't taken into, an, an, into account inflation and that minimum wage threshold just never goes up basically so or rarely goes up so we got to figure out a better system here i would think that you know we're smart enough to figure this out but uh the game of politics is one in which intelligence doesn't really come into play very often well it's hilarious <laughs> because social security they get cost of living adjustments for inflation yep. every year yeah so it's like why are we not doing that with the minimum wage <laughs> i don't know it's a good so point. the other day nikki and i went to chick-fil-a and I posted a video here on Twitter where they're now using robots to deliver the food. <laughs> so uh, granted, this isn't replacing all the employees yet, but you know, we've seen this in a lot of fast food restaurants like McDonald's where they've got the big screens where you order. Um, <laughs> and so I, I kind of tweeted something a little snarky here. I said, California says it's illegal to work for less than $20 an hour now. And then businesses say no more, fam. And then like basically showing the 
the the robot right so it's like okay what does this do when you jack up the minimum wage so high like you said a step function and it's just like what what does that do well it incentivizes businesses to automate right so it's it's a double edged sword and like yes i think everybody should have a living wage i don't want to see anybody living in poverty but what i think the libertarian argument is about minimum wage is it makes it illegal to work for less than that number right and there might be in a free and open market people that are willing to work at that and i don't know i i think it just I tend to lean more libertarian and I think it might make sense to let businesses decide and, you know, let them compete for workers. And if another business is willing to pay more then great, let the workers go there. But by setting that minimum rate, you're essentially making it illegal to work for less than that amount. And, um, one thing that I kind of quoted to a response here, you know, Oli said, what's wrong with people getting paid properly? I said, well, you know, making it illegal to work for lower wages, one, destroys jobs, two, puts a lot of small businesses out of business, and then they lose market share to place or to massive companies like Chick-fil-A that can afford to pay more and speeds up the rate of automation. So, you know, I think, you know, obviously Gavin Newsom, you know, definitely a little bit hard on the virtual sig virtue signaling side. So economics and you know, math versus politics. Like Trav said, it's not always the a meritocracy where the best ideas win. Well, well, the audience is already happening. We're seeing it with, you know, the kiosks. We're going up. We're not even talking to anybody and we're just ordering our food, right? And also I have a anecdotal situation, but a new grocery store opened. And when you compare the new grocery store to the prior, you know, the other grocery store in the area, the new one had half of, you know, the checkout line. It's mostly people checking you out with a human. And then there's a few self checkout lines. They did half of the whole entire, uh, checkout lines as self checkout. So they're, furthering this along you know we're going to be bagging our own groceries we're going to be dealing with the uh, doing god i hate ourselves. those checkout your things. favorite chris your favorite oh. i know how much you love i always those screw things. something up or i'm always having to wait two or three times for the guy to walk over and fix something or oh but man, that's so that's annoying. what's happening is these yeah. corporations know that that they can't afford the work. We talk to business owners all the time that are losing profits in their business because of having to pay higher wages. So it's choking them off and they're not making any more money, right? Margins are an issue. So it's like, yeah, there's definitely a, a, a dance that we're having to do here. And I don't know, but automation and AI and all of it, it's all coming for us. So this, in the this end- yeah, this conversation, this debate will, it, it, frankly, it's been a big debate for decades, but it will intensify as we get more automation and more AI capabilities here coming in the next few years. So yeah, you know, it's interesting though, post pandemic too, or during, even during the pandemic, we had labor rates going up quite a bit from a market-based perspective. Like there was more demand for labor and less supply, and you had a market-driven increase in wages. And uh, and so you could point to that as an argument that says, why why do you need to step function, raise the minimum wage if the market is doing it for you? And that's the libertarian argument. That's the capitalist, you know, the hardcore capitalist argument. Uh, and I'm, I'm fairly sympathetic to that. But I also do think you have to put guardrails around, um, you know, what can be done from a, a business, businesses exploiting, whether it's the environment or workers or whatever. You have to put some guardrails there. Like you can't have the capitalist system run totally amok. <laughs> yeah, uh, I but, agree with that. Yeah, it's uh it's it's a very interesting debate. Like like I said, it's going to get more intense in the next 10 years than we've probably ever seen. Yeah, and I mean, that is the big question, right? Is like what impact will AI and automation truly have? I I don't think any job safe. Um so, yeah. I've been putting together some be weird. I've been putting together some numbers on the economics of humanoid robots and it's a lot more cost competitive than I thought it would be. Uh, because initially I could make the argument, oh, these things at thirty, forty thousand dollars a piece are not going to make sense. Like people talk about, oh, the Tesla robot can do your dishes and do your laundry and all these things. And I'm like, well, if you actually figure out what it costs to have a dishwasher and a washer and dryer 
and a few minutes of your time folding clothes, it doesn't come anywhere close to the depreciation of a $40,000 robot. But then you factor in all the additional hours it can work during a day and the fact that it can be shared, the fact that it can be leased, and the numbers actually get a lot closer to being economic than I had originally anticipated. So uh, yeah, very, very interesting to see what this is going to look like in the next few years. Maybe that could be a good YouTube video for you to put out. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. I just, I just I had bet the people weirdest, would be really interested in that. I What's had up, the weirdest man? vision. I just had the weirdest like thought of a humanoid robot getting into an automated Tesla taxi and being driven from one place to another. Oh yeah. Whoa. Oh yeah. It's, yeah. That'll happen. Like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like the humanoid robot has to go pick up my groceries right so it gets in the <laughs> tesla taxi and it goes <laughs> i mean that's basically what that dystopian movie i think it was tim t.i.m yeah, like tim, holy yeah. shit that thing was terrifying yeah yeah watch it if you haven't seen future. it <laughs> well all right guys um let's do a recap and then we'll wrap it up so basically as of today bitcoin is consolidating around that 60 to 70k zone we talked about the potentials for um pullback areas based on the longer term monthly chart and how the market is absolutely due for a pullback i think the only question is how deep is it going to go and if you want to be dialed in, you know, I think also paying attention to the NASDAQ and seeing if there's correlation there with Bitcoin or not. Um, and like Nikki said, I think she's looking for a five to 10% pullback that would be considered a healthy potential dip buy. Um, also looking at gold. Uh, Trav said he's paying attention to oil and bond rates. What, what did I miss, guys? What should what should people be focused on and paying attention to over the next week or two? Yep, you nailed it. We also have big unemployment reports on Friday coming out of the U.S. and Canada, which could you know affect things in the market. But really, yeah, there's a lot of interesting action happening across multiple asset classes. We've got the halving coming up in crypto. It's going to be a very exciting month. Yep. Awesome. Nick, any final thoughts? Um, just don't freak out. You know, <laughs> we probably will see these markets pull back more and it's going to be okay. <laughs> probably great <laughs> dip buying opportunities ahead. So get in the please, community. Please buy the dips in attention. Bitcoin. Be yeah. My, my beard's getting a little bit long here. So hopefully we don't, <laughs> uh, we don't pull back too deep or else I'm going to just be looking like a homeless person. Well, I do <laughs> want to report to everybody watching that's followed us for a while that the beard has grown on me. So, oh, nice. I like the beard. Yeah. I just got to keep it trimmed up a little bit. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Nick. All right. Thanks, Travis. Thanks, Nikki. Guys, go to wetalkmoney.com, leave a question for the show, or wetalkmoney.com forward slash community. Check out the wealth building community. Leave us a review, if you would, on your favorite podcast platform. Make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel youtube.com forward slash we talk money because we moved it from my chris dunn tv youtube channel and trying to get people to jump over is a challenge so come on over guys join the party and yeah share this with anybody you think would get value from it and we will see you next week take care